every Sunday it seems like there is a little bit of um, uh, um, parting of the sea in the front row right next around me. I, I, I want to be, I want to let you know I do not smell, I don't think. I took shower this morning and, and I did everything to be hygienically clean. So don't be scared. I don't spit at you, I don't eat you or anything, so come. Sit, sit close to us, close to me and pass to me. All right. Uh, now, before I begin, uh, just want to talk to you a little bit. I don't, I don't know how you pray, and, and, and I don't know how you process the things that's happening around us in our life, in our, in our world we are living in. And I remember one of the uh, wisdom that I got when I was a young seminarian studying to be a pastor one of my professors is that he prays with news, newspaper open as he pray. Now we don't, we don't. Nobody uses newspaper anymore, and you have a tablet open with the news. He said he prays with newspaper open, you know. And and as we pray, I don't know what you pray. You know, at, at the things happening this this the last couple of weeks, at things that are everywhere, people are talking about, and I don't know whether it speaks you or not, and I know um, I've been bombarded and thinking about that, what happened in Charlottesville, probably about, is it 10, 10 days ago, just 10 days ago? But our nation is rocked in many ways, you know, and I've been praying about it, and really, and starting with, rather than getting angry, I look, looking at me, do I see any of those evil in me? Because I think a reformation always starts from within. Start from inside of my heart first. Is there wickedness within or not? And, and as I pray about it, as I pray through and the different things, and then look at different responses, whether I have been silent about some of the evils in this world. Probably I did. And also I thought about, on the other hand, that I don't want to be like many, it seems like many in our generation, social media generation, that if I put something up in Facebook, as, as if I've done my thing, which is nothing. Unless I, my life, change, putting up some post in the Facebook don't change nothing. And unless my heart begins to change the way I behave, begin to change the practical in my life. And I've been looking and thinking about it and, and repenting. I don't know why, but more and more I realized because I was a pres- I, I'm a president minister, that I still, I think, think like a white preacher, white right pastor than anything else, white right church. And I, I think probably do. You know, and, 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 and because we are part of PCSA Church, now equal, which is 95% white congregations. Maybe, maybe that's why, but I, and I'm, I've been looking and, and looking in my heart. But also other, ish, other things in, in this world. Now, the reason I'm mentioning it is because I think that walk and living as a child of God or Christian Believer in the Word of God, believe in our Lord Jesus Christ means I learn to process everything that's happening around me in light of who Christ Jesus is. That's what it means to have faith. I, I do that. To do that, I need to know the Word of God well, what God says. And I look at all things in the perspective. I want to respond, not react. Wisely, judiciously, I want to respond lovingly. I want to respond in courage. I want to respond as God wants me to be. Because I think, at least, at least I know I live in this great nation that I chose to be here. I know I, I didn't get my citizenship yet. That's another issue. Anyway, I've been living in the States since 1975. That's about 42 years. And I thought I was going to be a missionary some, somewhere in, in Central Asia or something that I decided to stay as a Korean citizen, it might be easier, better for me to go as a missionary. But anyway, this is a nation that I chose and I love. I call myself Korean American, even though my citizenship paper, I don't, anyway, that's another story. But you know what I mean. And, and the nation that I love, and the baggage, that, baggage and the privilege that comes along with it, I embrace all. I embrace the past of this nation that I chose as well as the values that this nation holds. And I call it as my home that I want to build. I don't want to just live here and uh, get, receive the benefits. I want to be here, be part of this nation that changes 
not only this nation, but this world as well, as a Korean American. So I think we are called to live out, be the salt and the light, salt of, light of the world and salt of the earth. We're called to do that. Because I believe our faith and trust in God is practical. We're living it out. Not just talking something out there, but we're living it out in my workplace, wherever I am, living it out as a child of God. And that's where we show our faith. Having said that, I need to say one more thing. Now, I'm, this is not my part of the message. I'm sorry. I'm, I feel like I've a lot of time. I'm long-winded today, but I, I, need to, let me, I need to say one more thing. Um, this has been weighing in my heart because as I was thinking about uh, some of the things happening in our nation, the racial tensions, I, I realized why I'm bothered about, I, I'm not comfortable with certain things. I know racism is evil. I believe injustice is being done. But the other aspect that really bothers me is that how we go about changing the world is, has to be biblical. Not, and, and Jesus, our Lord Jesus said, if somebody struck you in the right, right cheek, give them the left cheek. And it, it is not, it is not, the gospel doesn't go up, go up by fourth. That's under the religion, not us. Christian faith, is we do not push out our truth that we believe in other people's throat. No, we present it, we live it out, we be a witness. Whatever we do, we have to come out of love, come out of uh, uh, love our, our God without forgetting the issues. But that was the issue, that's something that I, what, what I had a, a little hesitance I had embracing some of the struggles we are going through. I need to hold on to both. I want to say evil is evil, wrong is wrong. But I want to do it in a right way as God wants me to do. I would rather sacrifice my life for it rather than, you know, where, where, the, where, where I desire somebody else's ruin or, or destruction. I will give my life, I sacrifice my life for the cause of God's grace. I hope that is making sense. So I don't know, if it make, I don't, I don't know whether it makes sense to me or not. Anyway. I wanted to share with, uh, with you that. Now, now I'm beginning my message. Okay, give me about 35 minutes. I'll, I'll try to stay with my, uh, I only have only about 30 slides, not like 50 that I usually do. Now, uh, I don't know if you knew, I am in midst of series of messages that I'm, of messages from the gospel of Mark. I, I, I remember about three months ago, I was, I was saying where I want to look at the, the Bible, the gospel, as what it says, not with what, what we generally are taught to think. I wanted to look at it. I want to see what the gospel, the good news says about who Christ is and how we are supposed to live. And literally, we are going through the gospel. Mark, really the question is, who then is this, this, this Jesus? And then we were going into that uh, scriptures. I've been, I've been taking every passage. I've been taking a section from each chapter, highlighting certain things. I'm sorry if you are not happy that I missed out some passages. That I'm, 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 gonna, I'm not going to talk about casting out demons of uh, kerosenes. I'm not going to talk about We're going to skip that. We're going to go into the next story. So, but we are going through. Now, if you want to look at every little story, every, every account in the Gospel of Mark, come and join me because this fall, we're going to study Gospel of Mark in the building place. Two and a half hour Bible studies every other Saturday. You want to dig into the Word of God. Then you can come and you can talk to me. All right? Okay. The Gospel of Mark begins with this word. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Beginning of the Gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, I need to say one, a couple more things. Prelim so many preliminary remarks. Sorry. I need to say this. This is important. I, I think I've said it before, but I need to say it again. To say... That as you are going through the gospel of Mark, the gospel is not a biography or, more, or form of a biography because if it, if it is so, if you see it that way, it is lopsided because highlights so much of it on the last seven days of Jesus' life on earth. It is not a biography. It is not a summary of historical events, although it accounts of historical things that happen. It is a gospel. So the gospel, Mark, begins by saying this is the gospel according of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So it is the gospel. So what is the gospel? 
Good news. So what good news is this? It's good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I need to say this because you know, none of the writers of the gospel are saying they are trying to say, every, say everything what Jesus did or taught. They are highlighting certain things to de- declare that Jesus, add, who, he, the good news that Jesus is and that, that he is bringing. Just wanted to say that. And he began by saying, the time has come. He said, he said, Time has come. Kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news, Jesus said. Which means that as you come, as you go through the gospel, Mark, it is calling or challenging us to encounter, telling us to decide. Every story, everything about who Christ has called us to decide, make decision about something in our lives. The, the, either we will, either we will turn and believe what Christ says, and live by what he says, or we will ignore or reject Christ. It's calling us to believe. As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, that the gospel is that keep on believing the good news. Keep on believe, believing the gospel. So, let's, so let me go on. Today's title is Your Faith Has Made You Well. I don't like the phrase, but I just, I'm quoting out of NASB. I'll tell you why I don't like that phrase, but I'll tell you correct phrase at the end. Reading from Mark chapter 5, verse 25, 34. Let me pray once again. Father, I come. But I pray the prayer that I've been praying many years. I'm not asking for wonderful oratory speeches or, or sermons. I'm asking more than information. I'm asking your presence. I ask, Holy Spirit, you'll breathe your life into the words that that we listen, we hear God, and we want to see, encounter, meet you. You want to you do more than get information. We want our lives to be transformed and changed because you meet us. We want to see you. We want to encounter you. We want to experience you, God. We want you to be Alpha and the Omega, center of our being. So we ask today, show us, reveal to us who you are. Meet with us, God. I ask you to break in into our emotions, into our will, break into our thoughts, break into our worldviews, break into our world systems, God, and come be with us today. I ask you to help me, the words be concise and clear. It will be clearly articulated, God. So we love you, we honor you, we give you glory. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Amen. Mark chapter 5, 25 to 34. Actually, that same story is with, also recorded in Matthew's gospel, Luke's gospel. But you're going to focus on Mark. Now, let me just read it once in verse 24. And he went off with him. Jesus went up with him. And a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. And you need to, this is important verse. I need to uh, read this. Verse 25. A woman who had 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 a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Verse 29, immediately the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately. Verse 30, immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the, po- that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? I don't know if he screamed, but he wanted to be heard. He did, I, don't, I don't think he said, who touched my garments? He wanted the crowd to hear. Who touched my garments? No, no, I, I say that just because I think I'm not good at this at all. But often we read the word of God very wooden, very factually. We forget to engage our hearts, our emotions in it. Now, I, I, I know, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm breaking in a little bit. As you said, I want you to imagine what kind of faith he had. 
Did he have an angry face? Did he have a um, curious face? Was he gentle, uh, kind, inviting face? Did he have? 31, and his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. He looked around to see which the woman who had done this. 33, but the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Verse 34, and he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. This is a story. Now, what I want to do is I want to dig into the word of God a little bit. Now, I'm, I realize I've been preaching since 1985 uh, as a pastor in some degree. That's 32 years. You know, and 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 you know, I I love collecting illustration, all kind of things. More and more, I love just studying the Word of God. See what it says. Now, that's what I want to do with you. Now, more and more, I'm I'm becoming in that way. I want to look at the Scripture and just talk about it. Maybe not as much as illustration, not as much as except anything but explanations and thinking about it a little bit. Let's look into the Word of God a little bit. Okay. Verse 24, I'm studying verse 24. And he went off with him. This story begins with this verse. Jesus going somewhere with this, this guy, this him. If you look at the previous passage, it says there is a rich guy, probably the leader of the synagogue, of, leader of the synagogue. Powerful, religious, powerful leader. He comes and says, Jesus, my daughter is dying and sick and dying. If you come and lay your hand, she'll be healed. And he comes and he asks, and Jesus now is on the way. The crowd is following him, on the way to Jairus' house. But his daughter is sick and dying. So Jesus is going off with him. And he says, a large crowd was following him and pressing on, in on him. Now that, that detail is important. The large crowd was pressing on him. People are following him everywhere. Remember the story? Remember the story in, I think, Luke, uh, chapter, uh, Mark chapter, was it 3? Where uh, two, where the house was filled and, and there's nowhere to walk in. People had to tear the roof roof to drop the guy who was sick. Remember that? Packed. People all around them. Now Jesus is on a mission. Now he's on a mission to go and heal this girl who is dying. Jairus' daughter. As he's going, he's in a hurry. I don't know about you. I am a, I, I, I'm a very impatient guy when I drive. I see some, some road block. If there's any delay, I, I'd rather turn around and drive somewhere else, even though it might be longer. I hate waiting for things. You know, and Jesus is now on the way. I, I want you to think about this man, Jairus, whose daughter is sick and dying. And he, I mean, he didn't care about his reputation. He humbled himself to came and asked, Jesus, can you come and help my daughter? And she is saying, let's go. My daughter is dying. And they're going together, and the crowd is not helping. They turn around, going, going with the crowd, and, and he's going to his house. The people are all around him. Now the story begins. There's a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years. She was sick for 12 years. And, you know, and it says hemorrhaging. Oh, the, some translations say issue of blood. And she's been, she's been bleeding. Many scholars think maybe it was a menstrual bleeding. Constant menstrual bleeding for 12 years straight. I mean, and it was not the sickness that would kill her, but it was un uncomfortable. It was not only, not only it was physical I and mean, tiring and bad, but also it was um, uh, socially devastating because those kind of, uh, uh, you know, sickness, Bible, Old Testament Bible considered unclean. You cannot be with people. Anybody touches you, you are considered unclean. You are not supposed to live with people. You are ostracized. You cannot go to synagogue because you're unclean. Because anybody who nears you, touches you, has to be cleansed. And wait for a day or so to be cleansed before God. And this woman, and he said, endured much at the hands of many physicians. And has spent all that she had and was not helped at all. She did everything she can. She can and she met many, many doctors, many, many weird people for weird things. 
I mean, she tried everything. Some I read, you know, some ostrich eggs, whatever, uh, some, uh, some, some kind of thing. I read about some people thought that if you had some kind of potions you make out of ostrich egg and different things. And she tried everything. And nothing helped. Not only did she spend all the money, it said at the end, rather at the end, she grew on worse. Grown worse. She did everything. You know, probably, uh, and, you know, I, you know, probably she was not a poor woman, apparently, it seems like. She had the money enough to spend all that to get everything working in her life, and nothing worked. Got worse. That's the woman here. Okay. I don't know where my notes. Okay. Sorry. Now, look at this one. I love this section. Look at this. Verse 27. Everything begins here. After hearing about Jesus. Now, this woman suffered for 12 years, did everything she can to get help. She didn't get any help. And now she begins to hear about this rabbi from Galilee, how he went about healing people. And he, and he healed the lepers and he healed the people. He cast out demons. They even, she even heard the story about how he rebuked the wind and commanded those sea to be calm. I don't know whether she believed it, but the stories are out there how he did amazing, miraculous things out there. But he, not only he taught word from God, word of God, the truth of God, that everybody believed he was a man of God, man sent from God. And she, her hope began to rise in her. And there's a verse I think I put, I put, I put up. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 15, 17, it says, So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. I don't know if you understand. Faith comes from hearing. Remember a few weeks ago when Pastor Young was here. You know, and, and Pastor Young who, who, uh, works, who works with uh, uh, Bethel Church in Redding, California and leading revival groups in the BSSM Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. Uh, I love his messages because some messages like Pastor Young's message, because he often speaks about the miracles God has done in his life. Because they're, they're living in a culture where these things are highlighted, these things are, this is really what they uh, seek and look for. God's healings were not as you hear those stories, what God has done. Our faith rises also. Our, our heart begins strengthened as well. So after, after hearing about Jesus, her faith began to grow, and, and she came up in the crowd behind. Now, this, because she began to hear about him, began to have faith, now she decided that she would come to Jesus. She came in the crowd behind him. I don't, know if you thought of, I don't know if you thought about this. Why behind him? Why not in front? Why didn't she break through the people coming in the front? And Jesus, help me. Why didn't she do that? But she remember she was unclean. If anybody touches her, they'll become unclean. So she didn't know whether she, I mean, I don't know. You can think about re- reasons why she would have not come in the front, but she came in the back. And she, as she breaks through the crowd and comes and touches his clothes, cloak. But she thought, if I just touch his garment, not I may or I might, I will get well. I will get well. If I just come and touch his clothes. Now, let me stop right here. Remember the, the guy I mentioned, Jairus? He said, come. If you come and lay your hand on my daughter, she will be healed. His faith was if Jesus comes and touches her, she will be healed. And she said, if I just come and touch his cloak, close a little bit, and I'll be healed. Is that a maybe superstition? Magic? Because a lot of people thought in those days, you know, if you go to some powerful person, you go near it, oh, you feel something near the person. Maybe she has a little bit, maybe a little bit of superstition, maybe a little bit of magic in that. But she still had faith, trust that he is able to heal me. And she acted, she acted, she pressed in and, and pressed in through. The crowd and came in with people everywhere. She pressed in. If you're desperate, there's nothing you cannot do. 
There's nothing you cannot do when you're, pres- when you're desperate. And she was desperate. She pushed in. She, you see, she was too desperate to think about what people would say. Public humiliation, rejection, condemnation, punishment, nothing would stop her. She pressed in and, and, and got closer to Jesus. If I just touch his cloak. Now, I need to see next verse, just uh, what, what happens here. Immediately, as she touches the clothes, immediately, the flow of the blood was dried up, and she felt her body got healed. Immediately. Immediately, right? Something happened. She knew something happened in her. Now, you need to go to next verse. Now, I'm, I'm getting excited, as you can tell. Verse 30, immediately, she's healed. Immediately, Jesus now, I want you to look very carefully. Jesus, immediately Jesus, perceiving himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth. She, he immediately realized power went out from him. Oh, pa- he, he realized, since the power went out from him, without him saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to heal her. Power went out from him. And turned around in the crowd and said, "Who touched my garments?" Now you need to, this is this is very interesting passage here for me. It bothers me. Doesn't Jesus know everything? Doesn't he? But somehow here, she he didn't know that that, that, that she was going to touch him and the power and that she's he's going to heal her. But somehow something happened here. The power went out from him without him knowing that it was going to go out. But after he went out, he realized it went out. Not only that, he didn't know who touched him. Interesting, isn't it? I don't know if you noticed that. Now somebody said, somebody wrote in a, um, was a read, a reading through uh, some sermons. He said, a stolen miracle. That's what it is. You're stealing is some, you get something without their permission, right? And she, her, her action, her touch, touch, stole a miracle from God. Miracle from Jesus. I don't even have thought about that. Think about it. You can steal a miracle from God. Sounds so heretical, right? I remember we, 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 we looked at the word of God about the Syrophoenician woman. When she, when, she, when she came because her daughter was dying, and demon fully, uh, severely demonized, she comes. And you know, Jesus ignores her, but she presses in. And Jesus actually rejects her. I was sent for the lordship of Israel. And she falls down and she begs. And then Jesus, not only, he, he goes on to say, it's not good to give the children, the bread for the children to the dogs. Remember the puppies under the table. And not only, says, it's not your time yet. Not right now. Not God's will yet. But by faith, but she received blessing and healing for her daughter. But this is a little different. They're stolen. Somebody stole power, miracle from God. Is that possible? Yeah, Bible says so. Doesn't it say in the scripture, Jesus says, from the time of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. The violent, violent persons, people who have a pers- a persistent and strong faith, breaks in the kingdom of God, and receives. The Bible talks about a stolen miracle. She comes. I don't want to think about that. Now, ultimately, of course, God allowed it. God's power healed her. If God didn't want to heal her, if Jesus wanted to heal her, this wouldn't have happened. You know what I'm saying. This is important. Yes, it is stolen but it was not like I didn't want to do. I didn't want to do it for you. But but she, her faith. Now just think about this: the faith, trust in Jesus. You're able to enter into God's before God. And and not only receive but take something that God could do for us. Amazing. Now we need to think about it a little more theologically. I don't have time for that, but. Now, 
the couple of things you have to ask. Jesus wasn't aware of this until the power gone out of him, right? Now, the question is, Jesus looks around and asks, who touched my garment? Why did he ask? That's the question. I, why did he ask that? Still doesn't end how she touched him and she got healed and she walked away. It doesn't end there. That's not the story. Story is that Jesus says, who touched me? He's looking around. Jesus asking why. The first thought I had was he wasn't looking to accuse her for doing something wrong, illegal, but he was looking to affirm her. I believe when, I, when, she, when he has who touched me? I don't think he had an angry voice. Who touched me? Not that. Not that's definitely not that. Now this is important. Because it's important. Our God, our Lord God. And Jesus, our Lord Jesus, reflects, explains our God the best possible way. And you look at Jesus, what he does, you see our God the Father. And he is not accusing her. He is not doing that. He asked for her sake, for the sake of others. Who touched me? And now look at what the disciples say. And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing on you. And you say, who touched me? Think about it. The people all around. And there are people rubbing their shoulders. Some people actually even touching him. And all things happening, nothing happened to them. The people all around. Even, you know, we are, we are small. Too. Even here, when, I, when you walk around, you touch people all the time. Sometimes I want to touch people because I like to, you know, touch people. You know, I'm a touch kind of person. Not as much be, be touch. I want to touch you. You know, and, and so, but, but all those people touch, nothing happened. But it only happened to her. That's the point, isn't it? Disciples saying, look, everybody's around. They're all crushed and pressing in on you and, and they're touching you. Not, what are you talking about? All, everybody's touching you. I touched just now. I touched you. I'm touching you now. So why are you, what are you asking, right? This is a crux here. Many come to near even Jesus. And they may even touch him a little bit. And nothing happens to them. Nothing happens. They don't see any miracle. They don't see any transformation in their life. Isn't that true? We see all the time. People seem to say, come and come to Jesus. Nothing happens. And yet we, our nation is supposedly, a, we, don't want to say, we are not a Christian nation. We have a lot of Christians in this country supposedly. And we don't look like one. We don't behave like one. We have Christian in name only. Our values do not reflect heavenly values or God's values. There are so many who come, so they say they are Christian. They, they say they make God and touch God and nothing happens. Their thoughts never change. Their heart never change. We are still racist. I think, most, I think all of us are racist to some degree. I believe we all of us are. I know Koreans are one of the most racist people I know. Because it has been for centuries, thousands of years, monolithic one group. They had a name for every other group around them. I mean, and I call them they because I, I'm Korean American. I'm not just Korean. Anyway, so we are, I think we are all racist to some degree. I tell this story all the time. I realize it is not, it is not, it is a, not a learned behavior. It's a natural behavior, I think. I'm just, by nature, I'm not saying it's okay. I remember when my daughter was young. Are we recording this? We need to cut this out a little bit because I'm going to talk about my daughter a little bit. I mean, when, 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 when I was, it's okay, I'm, so, it's okay, I'm just joking. Uh, when, I was, when I was at Princeton Seminary studying, you know, and Anna was probably about eight or nine months old. And we were living in an apartment, uh, and uh, right next to our apartment is a, uh, Afri- a black, black uh, a chaplain couple living in the studying at Princeton with me. And one day, just like me, I left the locked the car with the key inside. And I called my wife. I locked the car with the key inside. Can you help? So my wife asked our neighbor, and he drove me, my wife, Joy, and Anna 
in the car to come and help me. It's only a seven-minute drive. And Joey tells me, Anna, eight-month-old, looked at him, she began to cry all the way through the whole the school. She said, I was so embarrassed. She was so embarrassed. What does the eight-month, nine-month-old know? She just looked at this, look this man, and she said she will never take her eyes off him. And she's crying all the way through the school ride. I'm not saying this is okay. I'm just saying this is you know, because he is different from what she used to seeing, right? And she's, I don't know, fearful or something, and she's crying. It's natural in any, any, every one of us. When you see something different, what you do not know, we get fearful. It's based on racism or not. Or not. And we can go a whole lot develop it more, but I think we all have sinful bent in our lives. And that's what we all do. Why, why am I talking about this? Yeah? Okay, yes, who touched me? Okay. I, mean, I, know, I, know, I know where I was. And the thing is, so many of us and people say we are Christians, yet our values never changed. Our evil instincts and natural instincts we have are not transformed by the grace and mercy of God. It was not, we are not transformed in our heart. Jesus, the word of God says in Ezekiel 36, I'll give them a new heart, a heart of flesh. I'll put my law in them. That's what God, what, what God does. When Jesus Christ comes to our life, he put his word in us. He put his spirit in us, give us new heart. We are supposed to be transformed by the grace of God. It doesn't happen automatically. It happens by us continuing in faith, learning about Christ and repenting and believing in who he is and walking in the way. So I think many are touching him. Nothing happens. But Jesus is highlighting her faith, isn't she? Isn't he? Highlighting her faith. Who touched me? By that question, he is really asking the question. What about her touch that is different? What about her touch that is different? Sorry, let me take time to find my notes somewhere. I am too excited. There was, the, uh, there was a touch that was so much more than a touch, wasn't it? It's more than a touch, so much more than a simple touch. It was a touch with faith. We know that. Yes, her faith was tinged with superstition and probably tinged with little magic. It was incomplete, but still, she came. Her touch was touch of faith. Now, I want, you need to see that Jesus didn't reject her or rebuke her, but he rather, instead, he begins to explain to her and, what, 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 and I begin to tell her what she really did and what it meant. Now, her touch brought together two elements, faith and Jesus. You see, her touch brought two things together, faith and Jesus. When you come to Jesus with trusting in him, the miracles happen. Our lives are transformed. Salvation comes. You see, it was not the touch that healed her. It's more than a touch, wasn't it? But Spurgeon, this is what he says. I don't, I don't think I put a slide up there. Here is a great marvel of it all. Little as was her knowledge, great as was her unbelief, astounding as, as, as was her misconception of who Jesus is, yet her faith, it, because it was a real faith, saved her. Isn't it good? It was not a perfect faith. It was tinged with mysticism and superstition and magic. You know, and yet she comes, incomplete as it is, her faith, her trust in Jesus came. She acted. She drew near and touched. And she experienced a miracle from God. Literally stole a miracle from Jesus Christ, our Lord God. Look at the next verse. It says, 
But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, and came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Now, in Luke's version, it says, When the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before him and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. This is one of the other reasons why Jesus was asking who touched me. Not only highlighting of faith, but she began to tell not only Jesus, but all the people what happened, why she touched Jesus and how she got healed. Now she, became, she began to give testimony how she was healed by the touch. He wanted her to give a testimony. Remember, until now, she, for 12 years, she was alone, isolated, hidden, unclean person. Now, Jesus is not only healed, healing her, she, Jesus is bringing her out of the hiddenness, unclean, un, un, isolated, unclean, unclean person into public, one who had received God's blessing, one who had received healing, one who had testimony. He is bringing not only talking about faith, but also healing her in so many other ways because his salvation always involves every part of our life, not just physical, social, emotional, every part of our life he wants to heal and restore. Now, I want you to see what Jesus says. What does Jesus do? And he said to her, and we need to break this down a little bit, daughter, he is a woman. This is a rare that Jesus calls somebody a daughter. You are daughter of God. Daughter. He didn't say woman. He could have said that. I mean, you remember on the cross, Jesus says, woman, this is your son. Remember Jesus saying that to about his mom, mother, Mary? And John, this is your mother. Here she calls her daughter. You are daughter of God. You have, you have, your faith has made you well. Now, that's what I meant. Made you well really is not in the Greek. Greek really said, literally saved. Your faith has saved you. Literally, that's what it says, sozo. Your, your faith has saved you. But, you know, as a translation, that saved many means that she was healed, saved, and faith has healed you. Literally, it means your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. Not just uh, the talking about healing here. So your faith has saved you. And then it says, go in peace, shalom. Go in shalom. Shalom is a blessing. No longer are you cursed. Unclean, now you are blessed. Shalom of God be upon you. Go in peace. Then he said, be healed of your affliction and also your body healing as well. Not only now, but continue. May you continue in healing. Because I've seen people who experience God's healing, miracle healing, often they, the sickness comes back. And then and when I went to Bethel, they have, you know, they have sat in the morning, they have a healing room. They do public, it spends about a couple hours to go through. When you do that, and, and the, the four stations, the last station is where, how do you keep on your healing on you? How do you keep Stay in your healing that you have received from God. And they talk about that, which is, Jesus is saying, be healed of your afflictions. Continue being healed of your affliction. Continue in your health. Now, Jesus, not only did he, not only what Jesus was doing when he asked, who touched me? He wanted to correct her understanding. It wasn't your touch that healed you. It was your faith and trust in me that healed you. And he was also telling, uh, setting, healing her so socially and many other ways and giving a right understanding of who Christ is. And that, that's, that's what Jesus is doing. Because if she walked away, just healed and walked away, it was incomplete healing. Her heart has not changed. She did have a step of wrong understanding of who Christ is. Almost, you almost see Jesus as some vending machine. Many people consider God as a vending machine. If I put in a few prayers, ding, ding, ding. If I go to church a few Sundays, ding, 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 and put maybe offering, ding, 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 and then push the button, voila, comes out some blessing or miracle. People think God is like that. Of course, that's not, that's not it, is it? That's what you call prosperity of the gospel. If I 
Say, I'm a Christian, the God will bless me, give me everything I want. Give me Bentley. Or Martin, whatever. I don't want those things. I like my Honda CRV. Okay, anyway, you know, people think that. People still think God as some kind of heavenly genie or something. Jesus wanted her to know, understand who he really was. He loved and cared for her. And he asked, who touched me? Who touched me? Now, this is not the end of the story. Now, this, is, this, this story is in the middle of the ja- bigger story where the Jairus' daughter was dying, remember? And on the way, you have to understand, on the way, they're busy. Now, I want you to think about what Jairus is doing. My daughter is dying. Let's hurry up. Now, this thing didn't take, this took some time. She's looking around and who touched me? Taking time. He, he's over there. Come on, my daughter is dying. What are you doing? He's on the side. He is a rich Powerful religious leader. He will stop for this one woman on clean society's reject. He stops for her. He misses this busy schedule to the point her daughter, his daughter dies. He will stop for that one woman because she needed more than healing. She needed salvation in every way. And Jesus stops and, and, and talks to her and speaks to her and restores her. And there's more story to this. Now, uh, I don't know whether we'll come back, come to the, come back, come finish the other story late next week or not. I'll pray about it. Now, what is God saying to us? What is God saying to us out of this passage? And first of all, let's just see what, what the gospel of Mark is saying to the people at the time. You can have patience and get ready. I'm going to wind down. It might take 10 minutes to wind down, but I'm winding down, okay? Now, um, I found some pictures. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. And let me just stop here. Listen, this is important. True faith results in action. Your belief here does not turn into at least the, the, the obedience action. Then there might not be faith. There might be just m- mental assent. True faith results in action. Her faith, her understanding of who Jesus, her understanding, hearing about Jesus, she begins to learn about his Christ, begins to have hope, faith begins to rise in her, grow in her, and she acted on that faith. She came. As incomplete, incomplete as it was, she did act. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of affliction. Love that picture. Now this was the uh, next story. Be not afraid, only believe. Uh, let me, uh, so... Number one thing I see out of this passage, Mark is, the gospel of Mark is and good news is to believe who Christ is. Good news is about Jesus. Now respond by believing in who he is. Continue believing who he is and walking in his, in his trust, in, trust in Jesus. And he, and, and he will heal our hearts and lives. He heal our bodies. He will heal our minds. He'll our, heal our wrong understandings. He will heal our evil, what you call instincts, na- natures that we are born with, growing, living with. He'll try to heal all those things. Now, the second thing is that there is a touch of faith that heals and restores. The question is, am I touching him? Am I touching him with, my, with faith? Am I drawing him near? Am I touching him? Now faith comes by hearing, remember? About learning and hearing about who Christ is. Not only, yes, the word of God. We read about and we come to the Bible hearing what God says about who he is, what he has done, who he is to us. But also we value testimonies of others who have encountered God. And those become the the what do you call the, 
that things helps to grow our faith. In the end, and as we uh, step, take the step of faith, we see God answering our prayers. God breaking into our lives those stories will strengthen my heart and strengthen the heart of others to grow in Christ. Finally, the, th- the thought is that have you been desperate enough to press in, to touch him? Have you been desperate enough? I love what Pastor May shared last week. And as she said, when she said, we pray for Andrew Brunson, Missionary Brunson, I know him. You know, and, and we know him. We, have, we had him in our church. We had him grace retreat. But you know, he is in the prison now. And we pray for him. I pray for him every day. I do pray for him every day. I ask God for that. She said, is another thing to be in the midst of the church on Tuesday night when they're praying for their pastor who is in prison. Over 10 months now. And, and, and there is, they're, they're definitely desperate crying out before God. Are we desperate to press him, to touch him? Are we, am I desperate enough to seek the word of God for the answers, for the evils of our society? The evils that lurks in my heart. Am I desperate enough? Let me end with this. I, I've told this story more, more than once. Let me tell this story. I'll end with this. One of the most probably uh, most uh, moving time I had was probably, there are many, but one of them was I visited Korea, I think 1996. I think 1996. I visited Korea first time since been in the States. And went to, first time in my life, I went to a, what they call prayer mountain. There, there are a lot of prayer mountains in Korea. I went to the, one of the most notable ones, the one that started by the full gospel church up, you know, uh, up in Yoido, which is the biggest church in the world. And I went there with some of the pastors. We went, went up there, and it was a huge place. The whole mountain was up, you know, the uh, 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 prayer mountain. Literally, they had a almost stadium-looking look, thing where they can sit about 10,000 people. In the middle was a, you know, like almost a basketball court kind of floor, but a cement floor. They had a huge, almost like a square-shaped mat about this high, filling the whole middle. And a lot of people lying on, lying there with the blankets. These are people who are dying. And on the, and they, they, they had morning, the work, the prayer worship going on from four in the morning till midnight. One hour sing, they were sing praise. One hour message. One hour they pray. And these people are desperate uh, on, the, on, on the floor and they're lying down and they cannot move around. They are there, every one of them. And, 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 he, and the people, or, or other people sitting around the benches around the side of the uh, seats. And they're, so, they are desperate people and they are dying. And I remember, and, and then I went out, I saw on, on the hills of the mountain, they dug a hole about this high, about this deep. And they had a little door, and you actually, people, you go in there, you take your shoes off, you go in there, kneel, perfect enough. You, you, people be in there personally crying out. You see people, you have people screaming and praying in there. Personal horrors up there. And, 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 and there are different things there. But I remember walking down with a couple of pastors, and one of the lady came, and his baby, a grandmother, and a lady, and a baby came. And she came, and they came and said, Are you guys a pastor? And she said, can you pray for my, my son? It's about a little over a year old. Apparently, they are, they are farmers or somewhere. They said, you know, they are, working in the farm, they are working in the fields. And they brought the baby out. They have a little blanket out. And, you know, and, and, and the baby would play by himself while they are working on the field. And, and baby crawled one day and while they are there and crawled and drank insecticide. And she messed up whole system. You know, and damage at the stomach and damage at the brain too. And so this lady and the uh, grandmother and the baby was, and she was crying, can you pray for the baby? And, and she was desperate. The people like they were in the, in the place, the prayer mountain. The desperate people were praying. And I, I really, I felt like there was desperate prayer going on. I love I have in Kansas City. I love what they do. But when I go there, I don't feel the desperate prayers over there. I don't. But there I saw desperate prayers. People desperately crying out to God. And, there, and, 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 and that's and that prayer mountain. And then the people are there fasting and praying all the time, seeking God. And desperation. 
Even when I look at my life, the times when I experienced God, the most intense was when I was just desperate for His touch. I sought after God in desperation. Are you desperate to press Him, to touch Him? Now, and I, I tell you, I pray for Aaron every morning, cry out for, before God for Aaron. Some of you might know a 25-year-old girl named Somi who has leukemia. I cry out for her every morning, and I pray before God for that. And I pray for others of you. I, can, I remember I pray, and I ask God for answers. But the thing is that I need more desperation. To be, I'll be honest, not only for that, but for our nation. And our God is God who hears our prayers. God is good. Let's let's all stand.